Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. It became a contentious fight over a nominal tax cut today. The Bear County Commissioner's Court passing its $2.8 billion budget today and also lowering its portion of the property tax rate just enough to save the average homeowner a little between three and four bucks a year. Our Garrett Berger tells us one commissioner was so upset by the proposal she refused to vote on it. I abstain from this because I refuse to bow down and vote for something that I wholeheartedly disagree with. In a hotly debated move, Bear County commissioners approved a tiny property tax cut today, dropping the rate for the county portion of your bill from roughly 30.1 cents for every $100 valuation to just under 30 cents. Commissioners Justin Rodriguez and Rebecca Clay Flores fought unsuccessfully to keep the rate flat arguing that the reduction cuts 1.7 million worth of revenue while providing no real relief for taxpayers. I am not going to tell my constituents that I'm saving you four measly dollars. And even though the tax rate was lowered, higher property values mean you'll almost certainly still pay more on your next bill than this past one anyways. But Commissioner Trish DeBerry, who pushed for the cut, says it's about incremental change. So. It is symbolic that this court has taken the action to say that we are moving from a decreased standpoint in the right direction. A request for an additional $1.9 million related to a children's court and domestic violence also became entangled in the discussions of cutting the tax rate, though DeBerry objected to the two issues being linked. We've got to dig into this budget, and believe me, there is room to cut the fat. But it is not going to come at the expense of children or women. Commissioners ended up setting aside the money for the children's court, though it's not immediately clear where the funding will come from. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. New at 6, a middle school student facing criminal charges after officials in Northeast ISD say they posted a threat against Tex Hill Middle School on Instagram. Parents learned about that threat and arrest in a letter. That letter said the unidentified student had been charged with making felony terroristic threats. The threat comes after another threat against the school on Instagram by a former NEISD student. That's according to the principal. That person lives out of state now, but could be facing charges as well. This investigation is ongoing, but the principal told parents that the people responsible have been identified and that law enforcement determined that the threatening posts were not credible. A 39 year old man facing several charges after police say he hit a motorcyclist while driving aggressively. Kenneth Key Jr. arrested last night on the northeast side following the accident on the I-35 access road near Olympia Parkway. Officers say Keys hit a motorcycle from behind, drove over the 36-year-old rider, and then drug him about 100 yards. The victim left lying in the road while Keys drove away, still dragging the motorcycle, according to police. He finally stopped because he couldn't steer his car anymore because the motorcycle was stuck underneath it. We're told Keyes showed signs of being drunk and was combative before officers could conduct a field sobriety test. He's been charged with intoxication assault, failure to stop and render aid, aggravated assault, and resisting arrest. The motorcycle is taken to Brook Army Medical Center with critical injuries. It looks like another hit and run case that won't be as easy to solve for San Antonio police. They are still looking for anyone who saw the car that ran down a man on a bicycle early this morning. This happened on the access road near Interstate 35 and West Pyron Avenue. That's on the city's south side. As Katrina Weber reports, that bicyclist survived and is now being treated at a hospital. In a split second, a man on a bicycle went from the safety of a sidewalk to what proved to be a danger zone the Interstate 35 access road in the dark of night. The 35-year-old had been pedaling north near West Pyron Avenue around 4 this morning, but San Antonio police say he lost his balance due to the weight of what he was carrying in his arms, a duffel bag and television. They say it sent him off the curb onto the access road where a car hit him, then kept going. The man went to a hospital by ambulance, leaving behind what was left of his bike. Investigators went to work, looking through the debris for even the smallest of clues that the driver may have left behind. In order to piece together this case, police may have to count on those pieces of the car they found here for clues. They say right now they haven't found anyone who saw this crash. That includes the victim's girlfriend, who was riding behind him on another bicycle. She told police she never saw what or who hit him. While his bicycle may have come to the end of its road, 
Police say the man's injuries did not appear to be life-threatening. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Now to cannabis requirements. On September 1st, the Texas Compassionate Use Act was expanded. It now covers more people looking to use medical marijuana as an alternative medicine. Erica Hernandez spoke to one local doctor about what patients need to know before they ask for medical marijuana. In 2015, the Texas Compassionate Use Act made it legal to access low THC cannabis in the state, but it was only for patients with intractable epilepsy. On September 1st, the act allowed for more qualifying patients and doubled the THC limit from 0.5% to 1%. Here in San Antonio, only 10 doctors can prescribe medical marijuana. Dr. Ray Altamirano wants patients to understand the process involved to get it. If you have a diagnosis that qualifies, we want to help you. Next is we screen through our process, right? Um, what, what evidence do we have of you having one of these diagnoses? After receiving a cannabis prescription, the user must follow up to make sure the current dose that's given is working. The conditions covered include all forms of epilepsy, autism, multiple sclerosis, ALS, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's disease, CTE, all cancer patients, and PTSD. And speaking of PTSD, veterans who are looking for a prescription for medical marijuana, well, they're going to have to come to a place like Casa Salud because the VA will not prescribe it. Since marijuana is still listed federally as a Schedule One drug, VA doctors can't prescribe it. But if veterans choose to go elsewhere to get the prescription, they won't lose their benefits. Since September 1st, Dr. Altamirano is already seeing the shift in more patients seeking medical marijuana. It's going to improve some quality of life for a lot of people who have not even thought of it as an option. So we're not here to get you high. We're here to get you well. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look at traffic out there right now. An interesting situation here. This is the camera 1604 State Highway 151, the upper level. Your screen is not frozen. Things just are not moving. You can see that tractor trailer there pulling a mobile home. Looks like there's a dump truck in front of it. Officers there behind, but no one is going anywhere right now. We're not exactly sure why things are stalled at this point, but certainly could lead to a bigger backup as more traffic heads that direction. We'll keep an eye on this and see if anything develops. A new episode of KSAT Explains debuts right after this newscast, and this one, oh, it's going to make you hungry. We are diving into taco culture, the history, the evolution, and why both are important to the culture and identity of San Antonio. KSAT Explains San Antonio taco culture will be live streamed tonight at 7. You can watch it on KSAT.com, the KSAT TV app, and the KSAT 12 Facebook page. Now, if you can't catch it live, we'll post that full episode right after the live stream so you can watch it anytime on demand. The loudest crash you could ever think of. The whole house shook to where it, it sounded like an earthquake or a bomb. And that's when I ran out of the room and I saw the trees coming through in so many different places, branches in all different places. Once hurricane, now tropical storm, Nicholas has worn out its welcome in Texas, but slowing to a crawl before getting out of the Lone Star State. In addition to heavy rain and wind, several homes in the Houston area taking a beating. The owners of this home in spring woke up in the middle of the night when a tree fell onto their house. Several branches puncturing the roof and the ceiling on top of the destruction of the giant tree crash just onto their roof. The storm already dropping heavy rain in Louisiana where it is not wanted or needed as the people there are still recovering after Hurricane Ida. Mm, some cleanup underway there. I was talking to some friends in Houston today still without power this afternoon. A lot of people dealing with Nicholas's aftermath. Yeah, a Not lot us. of rain and wind. Here in San Antonio, though, things are just fine. Sky 12 over downtown tonight. Yeah, we're looking good, feeling good out there around here. We've got a lot of sunshine and some clouds developed later on this afternoon, kind of filled in the sky a bit, but overall we're looking at a very pleasant evening ahead. You look, take a look at our day today, 68 earlier this morning. That's a few degrees below average, and I think tomorrow's gonna be pretty much the same. 94 for our high temperature, that's four degrees above average for the day today. You take a look at the current readings, not that bad, fairly seasonable, 88 officially at the airport in town. You go to Stinson though, 91, Port SA 91, Divine 92, and Bernie currently at 82 degrees, but look at that, well into the 90s, almost 100. 
farther west and southwest of town. I mean, we're talking 99 in Del Rio and Catula. Breeze of Springs 95. Temperatures will fall off pretty quickly though this evening as the uh, skies clear on out. Temperatures down into the mid 80s at 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock near 80 degrees. And tomorrow morning, I think we'll start the day largely in the upper 60s, even mid 60s in the hill country. So Kerrville, Fredericksburg 66, meanwhile Pleasanton 71, and in and around San Antonio about 68 for the low temperature. By the afternoon, we do it all over again. We get well into the 90s, even a little closer to 100 as you approach the Rio Grande. And we're thinking about 90 Timberwood Park tomorrow, 93 Lackland area, 92 in Holotus. A lot of sunshine again, north northeasterly breeze at 5 to 15. We're, notice how these temperatures don't change much in the days ahead. We will talk about our rain chances and the latest on Nicholas and where all that rain with it is going coming right up. Just about time now for the first COVID-19 update from the city and the county of the week. Of course, they're doing those twice weekly now, and this is usually the day we hear about the positivity rate in our community, which has been consistently dropping. If things do seem to be trending in the right direction. We are certainly hoping that that is a trend that continues. Did seem as if there was some optimism at the end of last week. Let's go live to City Hall. By Metro Health Director Dr. Claude Jacob, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Uh, very first, uh, let's take a look at our positivity indicators, or excuse me, our, our progress indicators. Uh, and I do want to note that our positivity rate has dropped once again. It's now 7.1%, and that is again consistent with more testing that we've been seeing in the community. Our case rate has also dropped to 44.5 cases per 100,000. Our health system uh, remains in the upper end of the high stress score, uh, but is continuing to show improvements. So our risk level remains moderate. Uh, and we are continuing to monitor these indicators, especially following the Labor Day holiday. Let's keep masking up regardless of vaccination status. If you're still unsure about getting vaccinated, I encourage you to consult uh, with your health care provider and visit covid19.sanantonio.gov to get answers to your questions. Now over to the cases today, we're reporting 775 new cases of COVID-19 and our seven day moving average is now 818. Unfortunately, we are reporting six new deaths this evening, so please keep uh, their family and friends who are missing loved ones in your prayers. Uh, we are over 4,000 of our neighbors uh, that we've lost during this pandemic, and so uh, we know many families are without, and we need to remember them as we get through the next several months. There are 1,016 patients in area hospitals, and over the last 24 hours, there are 127 new admissions. 329 folks are in the ICU with COVID-19 and 194 on ventilators. 84 patients in the area uh, in area hospitals are unvaccinated. 84 percent um, are unvaccinated, and 20 patients this evening are children. Let me turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Well, thanks. It looks like everything is going the right way, but it's a slow way down. Every time we've gone through this, is our third major wave. It always goes up fast, but it takes a long time to come down. So we just got to be careful. Can't let up yet. We still got over a thousand people in the hospital. Way, way too many. Um, you read a little bit about probably today about the uh, difference of opinion on whether you need the third shot or not, the booster shot, I guess I should say, be third for the Madeira and for the Pfizer. And uh, while there may be some differences of opinion, the um, uh, FDA, I think, is going to meet this Friday and will, uh, I believe, make a decision whether to go forward with the booster shot. And if it does, uh, we will open back up at the uh, Wonderland uh, Center, uh, University Hospital, Bear County Hospital District, off room. But it, it's really, you need to let eight months expire before you get it. But we don't know yet what they're going to say, and we'll be staying tuned to um, – um, uh, what happens on, on Friday with the FDA. Uh, the Tobin Center uh, had an opportunity to uh, visit with uh, some of the board members and um, uh, regarding the Tobin Center. I'm really proud of what they're doing. Uh, they're being very careful with their events. Um, you have to wear the face mask. Uh, it's mandatory. If you're moving around, if you're sitting down, they certainly encourage it. But the minute you get up and move around, uh, they they require the uh, face mask and they're providing face masks for everybody. Another interesting aspect I never I never didn't know this, but some artists 
are very adamant about uh, people have to have a vaccination to come in or they have to show a negative test results. About a third of the performance is there. Uh, the artist wants it that way. So they do uh, require vaccination or they require a negative test or they refund them and let them go home. So uh, I think the Tobin Center is making every effort to make sure uh, people, people are, are safe. Uh, we will start the uh, free flu shots, not the COVID, flu shots, as we're entering flu season. I got mine um, just uh, late last week. Uh, and but we're going to be doing it at the Freeman Coliseum. Uh, it's going to start at 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, free. Uh, it was very efficient. I think we gave over 2,500 shots uh, one day uh, in, 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 in last season. So... Uh, you want the flu shot, you want it to be free, come out and see us at the Freeman Coliseum, 8 o'clock on, uh, on Saturday. Thank you, Judge. And as you heard last week, City Council approved an incentive for vaccinations. Metro Health will be offering $100 HEB gift cards. All right, so that's the very latest from City Hall. You heard from the mayor and the county judge. They seem encouraged by the numbers that we've seen so far. The big headline, the positivity rate dropping to 7.1%. Still too high, still higher than they would like it, but it is dropping. And as the county judge said, it seems as if it's it goes up quickly, but the decrease in cases slowing down. It takes a while. Yeah, and I think something that probably caught a lot of people's attention there, the talk about booster shots. Yeah. A lot of questions about who needs a booster shot and when. I know we hope to ask some of those with Dr. Ruth Bergren uh, later on this week in our Q&A, but the judge talking about if the FDA authorizes that, which is expected uh, to, they're expected to make a decision on Friday, then they are gearing up to open up Wonderland Mall again as a vaccination site for people who are in need of that booster. Yeah, a lot of plans being made. All right, let's switch over to weather right now and talk about Nicholas. I, I'm guessing the only effect we're seeing right now are maybe some clouds, and uh, that's probably going to be about it, Adam. Yeah, and that's it for now. It's just a little bit of cloud cover out there, and as the system moves away from us, it's going to draw some of those clouds away, and you see all that rain. Let's go right to the satellite and radar. Heavy, big rain shield. Far East Texas, but especially throughout Louisiana, stretching into Mississippi and even Alabama. It's, and it's a slow moving system. Now, here's a look at where it is and where it has gone in the Gulf and it's really just hugged the coastline. Mexico and then Texas got pretty close to South Padre and then went out just a little bit and then pushed onto Matagorda Bay, moved on shore overnight last night. Here's the latest with it's still a very low end tropical storm. But it keeps that tropical storm status. Max sustained winds 40 miles per hour, a few gusts up to 50, and that's in a small confined part of it. Mainly, this is a big rainmaker right now. Here's the issue, though. Moving to the east northeast at only six miles per hour. It's a slow mover, so all that rain. A couple more days of rain, Louisiana, parts of Mississippi, and Alabama. Around here, I've got a 0% chance Wednesday through Friday. Up to 10% on Saturday. That's basically to cover a few coastal showers that could pop up for our eastern counties, Lavaca, Dewitt, maybe even Carnes counties. And then a 20% chance Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. So we can't rule out a few pop-up showers toward the end of the seven-day forecast. But you look at the temperatures. We'll start tomorrow in the upper 60s. By the afternoon, we're in the mid-90s, and that's going to be the trend. Not much is going to change temperature-wise. Low to mid-90s for the foreseeable future here, but those mornings are going to get a little bit warmer as we climb back in the mid-70s in just a few days. Thank you, Adam. All right, there is no doubt the UTSA Roadrunners are on a roll, Greg. Yeah, to start this season, especially everything they had to go through, still got seven wins last season in Jeff Trailer's first year. But what was different about today's practice? When we come back, you will find out and an update on the injury to the Aggie starting quarterback, Haynes King, coming up. starting their season with an upset victory over Illinois on the road and scoring their first shutout in program history in their home opener against Lamar. The UTSA Roadrunners kick off play in Conference USA this Saturday when they host Middle Tennessee, a team they barely beat last year. 37-35 to go 5-2 and two in conference play. Should have been in the Conference USA Championship game during the COVID-19 pandemic, but that went to the University of Birmingham, Alabama, in the West, who played less conference games and finished 3-1. and one. Those facts and Mother Nature led to what happened this morning as the team returned for workouts. 
We had two things working to our advantage. One, Middle Tennessee really got after our tails last year, and we all felt out we were very fortunate to win the ball game. It's a conference game, so that got everybody's attention to begin with. And then, man, the weather was just fantastic. I don't remember the last time I coached with a jacket on on September 14th. So it was a dry day. It was a cool day. We had a breeze. It was just a beautiful morning. Uh, and our kids really responded with our, with our best practice of the year. I think we're more locked in. Uh, you know, it's a conference game, big game for us. So uh, I think we're more dialed in, and uh, attention to details a lot better. Kickoff in the Alamodome against Middle Tennessee, set for 5 p.m., where the Roadrunners will be 13-point favorites. After being embarrassed by the Razorbacks in Arkansas, 40-21, to UT head football coach Steve Sarkeesian has decided to change starting quarterbacks. He will start Casey Thompson over Hudson Card this week against Rice, as after he pulled Card in the third quarter after a turnover that led to a touchdown against Arkansas. Sarkeesian was asked to walk us through his decision to bench Card during the loss and install Thompson as a starter this week against the winless Owls. It's about are you maneuvering the offense down the field to score points. And I think uh, Casey's put himself in a good position to do that. Um, you know, obviously different circumstances as opposed to maybe what Hudson was dealing with early in the game. Um, but that's okay. I, I, I'm okay with that. I think both guys are competing like crazy. Um, and like I've said all along, we're going to need both of them. And I think it's fair to Casey to give him this opportunity, and we're, and we're going to let him go and see what happens. Kickoff against Rice and Royal Memorial Stadium on Saturday, set for 7 p.m., where the Horns are 24 and a half point favorites. The fight in Texas Aggies also making a change to starting quarterback, but for a completely different reason. That's after Haynes King suffered what we now know as a broken leg in the Aggies 10 to 7 escape from Colorado on Saturday. The injury happened when King was trying to scramble and was taken down by linebacker Guy Thomas in the first quarter. He would return to the sidelines on crutches, but according to reports, underwent surgery on Sunday and is now out indefinitely. Zach Calzada, who King had beaten out for the starting job, came in and went 18 to 38 for 207 yards and one touchdown. The only touchdown of the game for the Aggies turned out to be the game winner late in the fourth quarter. So how did Calzada in the huddle appreciate late in that game with all the pressure was on him to come up with a win? How did he behave? Who better to ask than the man that caught the game-winning touchdown? He was positive. We all kept a positive vibe. Nobody pointing fingers because we don't do that. It's not the standard. And um, we all just wanted to win. Um, Zach still showed that. Um, Zach got comfortable towards the end of the game. I feel like Zach's going to be really good for us down the line. Um, He's going to get more comfortable, more practice time. So we're going to be ready. The Aggies will host New Mexico this Saturday at Kyle Field, 11 a.m., where they are 27 and a half point favorites. So looking forward to some blowout victories, they hope. Yeah, they better be. They hope. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Greg. <laughs> Great. Our KSAP Q&A is up next. It's been both praised and criticized. A new voting law in Texas just signed by Governor Greg Abbott. So the question now is what will change when it comes to elections here in Bear County and what will change when it comes to taxpayer dollars and how those changes are funded to bring a perspective on this. We've got the Bear County Elections Administrator Jackie Callanan in today's KSAP Q&A. Jackie, thank you for being here. I want to just first talk about we have so many changes and, and things that this legislation, this law now puts in place. Let's start with the poll watchers, because the idea of observing voters has certainly been talked about uh, with this this new law. What's going to change there? Uh, the difference is we've had poll watchers and we've had them for years, which is, it, you know, it's a good relationship. What's changed is that they will have the ability now to move around the poll site. Um, in the past, it has said that we have, they would sit or stand conveniently by the election table so that they could watch who was being signed in, did they qualify, and so forth. Now they have the ability to walk around the room, and we just have to make sure that they don't intimidate the voters as they are voting. It does that include looking over someone's shoulder to see them voting? I mean, does it include that much leeway for these election uh, poll watchers? Well, they say not. Okay. Poll watchers have always been able to observe someone voting if that voter has requested to have an assistant. Then the poll watchers will go up behind them to make sure that the assistant is recording their ballot as the voter is required. But um, right now, we're still waiting to see that. The, uh, the bill says no, they will not be watching voters uh, actually vote with, on the touch screens. 
but they will be able to see them as they walk over to the tabulators to put their ballot in. What does this mean for vote by mail? For vote by mail, that seems to be the major change. Um, most of our, obviously, most of our voters are the over 65. It's, it's a, a rite of passage. And now the voters starting next year will have to put either their Texas driver's license, their ID card, or the last four of their social uh, on the application. And likewise, they'll have to put the same thing on the ballot after they have voted it and right before they've signed it. And so that for us, that's going to be a whole lot of new applications and new envelopes, because, of course, we are going to absolutely ensure the secrecy of the voters information, uh, because that mail ballot then will have, you know, their name, their address and one of those identifiers. So there's we're all looking at it. the secretary of state is to design it. Um, we've been on like our third version. So uh, we have things like that that we have to do. I believe that this law also prohibits uh, elections offices from mailing out mail in ballots to people who are not requesting them. Is that something that was ever happening in Bear County? Well, the, the difference is that it was mailing out applications. Uh, there's there's a difference in, and that has seemed to be a confusion. Uh, we've never been able to mail a ballot to someone unless we have an application in. And as we know, uh, last year in November, Commissioner's Court made the decision to send out an application to everyone over 65 after Harris County did it. Uh, and that now has been set aside. Uh, the voters normally get most of those applications from consultants because the campaigns all you know, hire the consultants and they do the mailings to the people over 65. Talk about, we talked earlier about the new video surveillance, not video surveillance, but video monitoring, I'll put it that way, uh, <laughs> that is going to be in the elections office for some of the biggest counties, including Bear. that that's going to be an additional expense. It's, a, it's like a election night, elections office live stream, for lack of a better word. Uh, yes, and and, and the, that is not, covered by any more state money uh, is what are some positives that you see out of this new law that came in? Uh, again, the positives uh, we're, when we're speaking about this live streaming, um, we're, we're sort of in unknown territory on that. Uh, the cameras, we've had some vendors come in to look and see and, and tell us about the cameras that have to come in. But the concern with the unfunded mandate on that is that we would be required to have these, right now they're saying about 11 cameras. We'd have those on from about two weeks before the election to at least two weeks after. So we would have a month of 24 hour a day streaming, but then we must keep that. We must maintain that all of that video for a calendar year. Mm. And that's going to be a huge unfunded mandate. There are a lot of unknowns uh, when it comes to this law. Cost is just one of them. But what about the challenges that this is likely to face uh, in a court? And where does that leave your department in terms of trying to figure out the next steps? A lot of planning, I'm sure, has to go into making these changes. But you're waiting to see what happens with any challenges. Yes, ma'am. That's admire. You're, you're just, you know, you, you've hit the nail on the head, so to speak. I mean, the lawsuits are already out there. And in, in, in fact, I was served with another one today. Uh, and it, it basically is asking us to, to stand down until this is all decided, because there are so many pieces in SB1. So as, you, as you're absolutely right, as, as an administrator, we have to plan for the future, um, but not sort of <clears throat> pull the final plug on it, so to speak. Um, and right now, you know, we have this surprise election for District 118. And so we're doing that and then the November election. And so we'll see how this all plays out by the time we can come up for a breath of fresh air after the November election. We hope you can. I certainly appreciate what you and your volunteers and, and election judges and all of you do. And uh, I guess if you go out and have to buy cameras that may be challenged in court, 
Just keep the receipt. <laughs> Jackie, Smart. Cal Jackie. Yeah, of that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. Our elections administrator for Bear County. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Good to see you. We'll be right back. Tropical storm Nicholas slowly moving east, dumping heavy rain hours after making landfall on the Texas coast as a category one hurricane. Now people on the Gulf Coast bracing for life threatening storm surge and severe flooding just two weeks after Hurricane Ida's powerful punch. Chris Wynn on the Gulf Coast with the latest. For us, that means there is a flash flood watch in effect through at least 7 a.m. on Thursday. Hours after making landfall on the Texas coast as a Category 1 hurricane, Nicholas now moving dangerously slow to the east. Threatening to bring high winds and dump up to a foot of rain in parts of coastal Texas and Louisiana, raising concerns for flash flooding. The National Weather Service predicting life-threatening storm surge of up to five feet as Nicholas bears down. It will be a very slow moving storm across the state of Texas uh, that will linger for several days and will drop a tremendous amount of rainwater. Those dangerous storm surge warnings and watches extending to Louisiana, where people are still recovering from the devastation left behind when Hurricane Ida hit two weeks ago. One of the things that could exacerbate the, the threat of flooding are all the ditches and catch basins and storm drains and so forth, all these drainage systems that have debris uh, from previous storms that hasn't yet been cleaned up. More than six and a half million people are under flash flood watches that extend from Texas to the Florida panhandle. In Texas, several hundred thousand customers are without power as crews wait until weather conditions improve to tackle repairs. It's too windy still for them to go out and fix those down power lines. It's uh, dangerous for their crews. Reporting from the Gulf Coast, I'm Chris Wynn. Take a live look with live cam right now. 87 degrees here. We haven't really had the high 90s or even mid 90s this week so far, so that's been nice. It has been nice and a nice sky there too this evening for sunset. We should have some decent color out there, so should we call it a sunset advisory maybe, right? Get outside and uh, sunset just about an hour from now. You should be able to get some good color at that point and thereafter, shortly thereafter. 88 degrees currently. It's pleasant outside. Northeasterly breeze at 12 by 10 o'clock down to 80. No rain chance this evening and rain chances are pretty slim, but we're going to talk about that. Nicholas, the latest with it, where it's headed, where all that rain is going. Coming right up. There is a vacation rental in Minnesota that's going to let one fan go nuts. The yep. Planters Nutmobile now open for business. The 26 foot long peanut on wheels located on waterfront property in Duluth. It costs $3.59 to rent. No zeros left off of that. That's the same price as a jar of planters peanuts. Yeah, but there's only a single booking for a two night stay in this giant peanut. <laughs> I love this story. The winner will also get a $1,500 travel stipend. It also comes with plenty of peanuts. To find out how you can enter, go online at Mr. Peanut in I N N a nutshell.com. It'll be interesting to see if it's worth the money, if it's all it's cracked up to be, or I I, if I, it, people feel shell shocked. You know, I, you know, It'll be interesting I don't know to if see I need what, to be worried what happens. that I can read his thoughts sometimes yeah. or if I should just accept it. Yeah, accept it. From Taco Tuesday to tacos every single day. That's Ooh. what Taco Bell is apparently going for. The chain is testing a subscription service for tacos. Customers pay five to 10 bucks a month for what's called a taco lover's pass that lets them get one of a variety of tacos each day for 30 days. Yeah, food subscriptions may sound odd, but Panera also trying out subscriptions, including a monthly plan that they will give you a free cup of coffee every day. Taco Bell, by the way, trying out the subscription service at about 20 of its Tucson, Arizona restaurants. No word will it might roll out for the rest of the country. Ah, oh, don't forget, in case that explains all about tacos, tacos. tonight. Yeah, oh, man, it's, it's a good one. Puffy. OK, today we, we cover that. Today is the day to let your imagination run wild. It is National Live Creative Day, which reminds us to take some extra time to experiment, discover and dream. Rediscovering an old hobby can help get your creative juices flowing again. It looked like that was the 
my friend the butter cow from the Iowa oh, State yeah. Fair that I covered a few years ago that that guy was working on. Anyway, if you don't have a creative bone in your body, don't bind yourself by traditional constructs of creativity, my friends. Uh -huh. Even looking at logical problems involving math or a computer code in a different way, maybe thermometer making, can lead to unexpected results. Many of the world's greatest creative thinkers have also been able to be some of the most creative. Mm. Greatest thinkers have been the most creative is what I meant to say. Adam, are, are there some new ways you need to be looking at thermometer making? Do we need to make some changes there or? I'm always thinking of new ways and trying new things. That's the problem. I run out of time then. I don't have time to do what I need to do yeah. get it done. Creativity is really not your weak point. No. I just want to say that. That's you have a creative mind. Well, thank you, but it also takes a little bit of help and you know, it takes a group of people in a team to bring it all together. This yeah. is your village. <clears throat> yes, and it helps for Thermometer sure. Thermometer village, right here. <laughs> oh, Thermometer Your village. thermo home. Thermo home. <laughs> your thermo home. <laughs> <laughs> I like this. What's our population, <laughs> Thermometer village? Uh, let's see, about Three, four right four. now. <laughs> <laughs> but growing. So Santa Nicholas, Jim. we got to include Santa Jim in there. Oh yeah, that's right. Of course, yeah. we're at five. Okay. <laughs> Nicholas is weakening, mainly dry around here. We're on the dry side of that system. Temperatures in the 90s, but we're not talking outrageous heat. Just a little above average for this time of year. By the way, notice my computer back here. I went to that planter's Mr. <laughs> Peanut and yeah. I still had to check on it. Yes. I just had to do it. I couldn't help it. How far is your Minnesota cabin from where that is? Duluth? Yeah, about three hours. But it depends. Oh. If it's in the winter, you have to factor in the snowmobile ride, which adds a little time. You got to carry in your gear. Yeah, I do. I would. I just wondered. Yeah, he, he wanted briefly. to help. answer. You didn't really <laughs> care. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's get right to it here. Check this out. The Duluth, Minnesota, home of Dennis Kasky, my father. That is the hometown. That's where he was born and raised on the west side of Duluth. Duluth, as he says. Ah, Duluth. Got to go to Duluth. All right. So taking a look at the satellite, you see we're on the dry side of Nicholas. You see the distinctive spin just east of Houston. A well-defined circulation here. It never had a well-defined eye to this storm, despite being a low-end Category 1 hurricane last night. And as the sun sets, that's why you're not really seeing the visible satellite imagery very well. It's visible satellite imagery. It's like just putting a really good camera up in space, but we need light, daylight, to actually take these pictures, and that's what we have now, or we're starting to lose that daylight. But you look at the radar, put it on top of it, and it's still streaming these showers on shore, particularly on the north and east side of the storm. We're on the drier side, some drier air, whereas Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, they're getting some rain from this. Here's our future cast, and they're gonna continue to get the rain, especially throughout Louisiana, stretching into Mississippi, and even Alabama. Looks like we have a few more days of rainfall along the central Gulf Coast as a result of the remnants of Nicholas. So the winds are dying down, but of course there's still a lot of rain to be squeezed out of the atmosphere. So no chance of rain around here the next several days. We've got it at 0% through Friday, a lot of sunshine. Into the weekend, we bump it up to 20% by Sunday and into early next week. Oh, I love this sky for our sunset. Nice wispy clouds aloft, some cirrus clouds. So it should be pretty colorful sunset. 68 this morning. That was a pleasant start to the day. 94 by the afternoon. Right now we're at 88 degrees. Dew point is 66. Not overly humid. We have some mugginess in the air, but it's not the oppressive humidity. Where we've had nothing but sunshine today, a little bit hotter upper 90s, closer to the Rio Grande, whereas Bulverde now at 83, we're 91 Stinson and Bandera at 88. Tomorrow we start the day at 66, a great start to the day. Mostly sunny, but making it up to 94, so back into the mid 90s and a north northeasterly wind at 5 to 15. Closer to 100 along the Rio Grande and then the rest of the week, no big temperature changes, a lot of sunshine, just slight rain chances toward the end of the weekend. All right, thank you, Adam. We'll be right back. Here's today's in case you missed it. And a good morning to you. It is Tuesday, September 14th. New this morning, San Antonio police are looking for the driver who hit a man on a bicycle. That's where officers say the man in his 30s was riding his bike on a sidewalk but veered in the road and then was hit by a vehicle. The driver of that vehicle took off. 
The man who was hit was taken to a hospital and is expected to be okay. New this noon, police trying to track down multiple suspects after two people were stabbed. Police say the suspects pulled into the parking lot where the victims were and then started stabbing them. It's not clear what motivated that attack. Police say the suspects then took off down Callahan Road. The victims were taken to the hospital, one man in critical condition. Four months after they were discovered at his mother's home, the remains of baby James Chavez have now been released to his family. The family says the ashes of baby James were given to them today, closing this chapter in his mysterious death. His mother, Delaney Chavez, was arrested for tampering with evidence, but no other charges have been filed against her. All flights of Afghan evacuees into the U.S. have been halted for at least a week. The Department of Defense says they are working to immunize evacuees before they arrive, and those already affected are being housed separately and are getting medical care. As contact tracing continues, and some are asked to quarantine. Winds up to 95 miles per hour, toppling trees and gas station roofs, debris scattered across coastal Texas. Nicholas making landfall near Galveston overnight, flooding streets and cars. This dock submerged and an entire neighborhood underwater. 